Good afternoon, my beautiful babes and babettes. I'm your resident active advocate, rapidly switching accents. And today, I would like to talk to you about a book called The Cripples Club by William Bell. Spoiler warning. Okay, so issue number one right off the bat. I'm not a fan of the word cripple, but issue number two right off the bat. That's not my place to say exactly. The word cripple is being reappropriated even as we speak, or even as I speak, by people who have mobility disabilities, particularly. And they are taking that word back as a sort of identifying this is our community sort of word. And, um, it's not my place to say wh uh, whether I have a problem with this word or not. It's just not my place to use it in an offensive way. So whenever you use a word, and I made this rule for myself a while ago, but whenever you use a word, don't use it unless you know what it means. Don't use it unless you know the historical context behind it. I think that's a very important rule, and it's not even a form of censorship, it's a form of knowledge. If you know what a word means and that coming from you, it could be offensive to another community, don't use it, especially not in front of a member of that community, right? I mean, use it in your own head if you feel so inclined. I don't care what you do inside your own head. Just don't be offensive out loud, right? Because thoughts are free, words are free, but we make one another freer by using accepting language. So that harkens back to the, uh, to the title, but this book is problematic, sort of. It does a lot of things right, and it does a lot of things wrong, in my subjective opinion. Read it for yourself, please. It's a very interesting read. So one of the things that this book does right is intersectionality. Another thing that this book does right is the power of friendship. Uh, aw. Okay, so if you remember from our vocabulary, uh, vocabulary class, intersectionality means the crossroads at which two minority statuses meet. So let's say you are indigenous and homosexual. Let's say you are black and blind. Let's say you are, this isn't a minority, but female and mm, a wheelchair user. Sure, why not, right? All of these things are considered, and I quote, lower on the hierarchy because I'm so supportive of hierarchies. But when they cross over, they create A, bigger problems, but B, a richer and larger identity for the person involved. Every single living human being, I don't care who you are, has intersectionality going on in their personality. It's the reason why we all have more than one trait to us, more than one defining, you know, personality characteristic. I'm a loud mouth, and I'm female, and I'm white, and I'm disabled, and la di da di da di da right? No person can be defined or should be defined by one single character trait. When it comes to intersectionality, though, um, this can be perceived as an issue by the, by the self-assumed in-group. You know, if you're a rich, white, able, abled male living in America and speaking English, and, you know, upper middle class, la -di da all these things that you, quote, have to be to be, quote, normal. You're going to be seeing me use a lot of quotation marks in this video, by the way. You know, if you don't fit into those particular intersections, then your intersections are considered problematic. However, intersectionality creates, as I say, and in my own opinion, a much richer identity to the human being. We are not one thing. And we're not meant to be one thing. This is why diversity exists in the first place. That and the fact that people are born in different parts of the world, which makes their skin different colors, and, you know, which is why racism is stupid, because it just has to do with the exposure to the sun your ancestors had. Okay? Deal with it. 
So one thing that this book does really well is, is, is intersectionality because our POV point of view character, George, is South Asian and he also has really, really horrible memory problems because of trauma brought on by war in South Asia. Spoilers. But he meets a bunch of other people who have their own intersections going on. Uh, he meets a boy named Hook, or that's not his real name, but he goes by the name Hook because he is a wheelchair user and is also missing a hand. He meets a girl named Heather, who is deaf, and he meets a black girl named Amy, who is blind. Now, all four of these kids get to go to the same school together, which to us nowadays would seem like no duh, right? But this book takes place in the 1980s in Canada, when legislation was just being changed and updated to allow students with disabilities to all attend the same school. Unfortunately, one of the things that this book does really poorly, but is a reflection of the time, is that these kids have to figure out their own accommodations because the law had not caught up with that part of things yet. It's like, you can attend this school and you can attend this school. That's it. You know, we're not going to help you any further than that unless you can figure it out for yourself. So all these kids are being mainstreamed, but they're all being put also in regular classrooms, which to some of them may not be overly beneficial, but for some of them definitely is. You know, for George, especially for his, uh, for his social skills, that helps. And he also gets to meet his friends through this method of schooling, which is nice. Another thing that this book does really well is, as I say, the power of friendship, oh. because the four of these people figure out that they can, okay, this part's problematic, they can fill in one another's holes, I'm using quotation marks to the emphasis, by helping one another out. You know, Hook can't use his legs, but the other three can. You know, Heather can't... Heather can't hear, but the others learn sign to help her out. Amy can't see. The others sort of operate as her eyes. George has memory problems. The rest of them help him remember. You know, it's sort of like they're acting as, quote, limbs on one body, right? And they're all acting from one another, which, okay... It's very beneficial to have a supportive network of friends and family members. But when you consider these things holes or deficiencies, quotation marks, then you are basically master statusing yourself. To master status, verb. You are master statusing yourself and your friends in this case. And I don't approve of that logic because we are all whole. We are all complete units unto ourselves. And that's what intersectionality is for. So that's another thing that this book is sort of ambiguous on. But okay, so intersectionality and the power of friendship, they do great. But accommodation, they do very poorly. But that was the problem at the time in Canada. And another thing they do kind of badly is the public response to people with disabilities. In this book... Hook is forced to use a manual wheelchair because he's getting bullied by a bunch of people who tie him to his electric wheelchair and send it on just a big trip down the road and he almost gets himself killed. Well, I shouldn't say gets himself killed. He almost gets killed by a car and then George pull manages to yank him out of the road just in time because George is also very strong because he's a martial artist. And the one thing that you don't need a very good short or long-term memory for would be the arts, martial or otherwise, because it's your muscle memory taking over. And your conscious memory does not control muscle memory whatsoever. So after Hook's run-in with this very ableist gang, he is forced to use a manual wheelchair, which strips him of a very important accommodation that he had had for himself. 
other forms of accommodation that are not done well in this book are just the general educational ones. Like I say, they're all mainstreamed and put into ordinary classrooms, but it's like you have to figure out how to do your own braille. You have to figure out how to read lips because your teacher is not going to know sign um, when, uh, when you're Heather and you're deaf. You know, you have to figure out how to get your homework done properly if you're George and you have these memory issues. But later on in the book is more about them finding their own identities as individuals, but doing so together. They all take a road trip together and sort of go camping for a while on their own. <clears throat> and their parents are worried about this, naturally. And they do encounter some roadblocks, shall we say. But, uh... The problem I have with the ending of this book, and again, spoilers, all right, but George gets quite a bit of his memory back. It's almost a bit of a miracle cure narrative, you know, and I have problems with that narrative, as you are all well aware by this point if you've been watching this series. And he doesn't have all of it back, but he has most of it back, enough to remember who he is, where he's from, why he is in Canada in the first place. And, you know, he's used his friend's help to figure out, even in absence of memory, where he had been from, or at least an approximation of where he had been from. But then when they're sort of alone on this island and isolated, he just remembers kind of off the bat. And I've got a problem with that because it's just, it doesn't speak of realism to me. At the same time, however, I have actually encountered memory issues of my own in the past. Yes, you can get things back, and you will get things back, most likely, unless the brain damage is too bad, but they're going to come piecemeal. They're not going to come in one big flash of light sort of thing, you know? So it's the timing rather than the actual incident that I find to be unrealistic. So The Cripples Club is a bit of a mixed bag for me. I really do like the dynamic between the four friends. I don't like the dynamic of the fact that they are, quote, filling in holes for one another. I don't like that. You know, as I say, as I emphasize, we are all whole and complete units unto ourselves. We are all whole and complete human beings, just as we are. You know, and the problem I have with the medical model is that it it's more of a glass half empty sort of ethos. It, um, it's like you're coming into this world with these deficiencies and here's what we can do to fix it, but we're also still gonna look down on you for having these deficiencies. Quotation marks around the word deficiencies, thank you. You know, but not every person feels that way about people with disabilities, obviously. If they did, then we wouldn't have intersectionality. Because there are nice people and there are jerks. And there's everything in between. Because pretty much everything in the world is on some kind of spectrum or bell curve. N not just a big, like, this or this. It's not a dichotomy. It's, it's a curve, you know. Which I have explained before in this series, and that also applies to disability and degrees thereof. So that is a very basic summary of The Cripples Club by William Bell. I really, really want you, got, you guys to read this book because it's quite interesting if you can find it. Have fun. All right, so that's going to be my last book analysis of the year. Tomorrow we will be doing some holiday fun sort of things, and... I will see y'all tomorrow for lovely holiday goodies. Yay! All right. Very well. Bye. Mm -hmm.